Well, good morning. Happy week after Easter. You know, what's happened with a lot of my messages here over the last several months is they've been changed. If you've been following us, you, you kind of know that, that I'd have something planned for one particular week, and then we would run into a situation with the virus and society and so forth, and I would change that message. And one of the things that I had initially planned on as we approached Easter is to preach more than one message about Easter and what it truly means to us. And so I'm going to kind of do a follow-up this morning to last weekend's Easter message about being forgiven and being accepted. And Easter and Christmas in our country, now that may have changed from what we're going through right now, but typically are the two most church-attended Sundays of the year. And again, I, I think there were a lot of people watching online, but it was a lot different having Easter the way it was last week. But we get all these people, and they, they come to church on Easter, they come to church on Christmas, and then what happens the week after? Well, one of the things I think we can find is, is the Bible points us to those types of things in the words that are in it. There, Solomon in Ecclesiastes says, there's nothing new under the sun. What we see back then is often true today and so let me give you a little illustration of what happened in Jesus's time the week after Easter so he has has been crucified he has died on the cross now at this point he has risen from the dead but two of his disciples are walking on a road to Emmaus now that's kind of like Volga Emmaus is about seven miles from Jerusalem so they're walking and, and all of a sudden this guy comes along and he meets with them, and they don't know at the time that it's Jesus. The Bible says that he has veiled their eyes. He has prevented them from recognizing him. Uh, now, why would he do that? Well, we read later in the story in Luke 24 that he wants them to see him in the Word. And that same thing is true for us today. He wants you to be able to see him in the Word of God, not necessarily in person. If, if we could only see and recognize Jesus in person, then we don't have the same opportunity that they did 2,000 years ago. So again, let's pick up this story in Luke chapter 24. Now, actually before I get into that, let me remind you that the sermon notes, a uh, study on this particular sermon, and a devotional are available on our web page, www.aobrookings.org. So if you'd like those notes, then you can go to that web page and you can see those notes to help follow along a little bit better because obviously we're not going to have them up on a screen for you today. Okay? So you can do that, but let's pick this up in Luke 24. Now remember, as Mary goes to the tomb, and she's looking for Jesus. The angels say to her, He is not here. He is risen. And then they say, Remember how He told you? So He's already told them what's going to happen, and they have fallen into unbelief. Now He meets these two disciples on the road, and He says, Two followers of Jesus were discussing and arguing. Isn't that interesting? There was discussing and arguing in the church even 2,000 years ago. So they're discussing and they're arguing, and they're discussing and they're arguing about what has just happened. And Jesus comes along and he says, hey, what are you guys talking about? And they say, haven't you heard? Where have you been? I mean, it's kind of like talking to somebody about the coronavirus situation. And they'd come up to you and say, what's going on? Why is everybody inside? And you'd go, well, haven't you heard? And so they're, they're kind of astounded that Jesus doesn't know what's going on. And so when they, they say to him, these things happened to Jesus, the man and the prophet, we had hoped he was the Messiah. So a week before, they're believing, and then all of a sudden these things happen that they don't expect. They, they, they weren't planning on Jesus going to the cross and then dying and so all of a sudden, their world just goes upside down. Does that sound familiar? That They had believed everything was going good, and they were believing while things were going good, and then all of a sudden, things changed. And things became not so good, and it affected their belief. So they went from assuming and believing that Jesus was Lord and Savior to now they're saying, oh, you know what, because things aren't great, he's just a man, 
he's just a prophet. We thought he was the Messiah, but obviously he wasn't. Now listen to Jesus' response. Again, we're talking about what's happened in the days following Easter. We're talking for us what's happened in the days following last Easter. Last Sunday, when everybody, a lot of people in our world, were attending church or watching church, and we're trying to find out the parallels here, and Jesus says, how foolish and slow you are to believe what is written. How foolish and slow you are to believe what is written. And I think, unfortunately, that can describe the church today. We, we seem to do pretty good when things are going good, and then all of a sudden we, we run into a bump in the road, and, and all of a sudden our belief just goes out the window. And so Jesus is saying to these two, and it's, it's kind of something he's saying to the church today, how foolish and slow you are to believe what is written. They don't, they, this is just days after his death. They don't believe. It, it's the week after Easter services for us, and sometimes we don't believe. Sometimes we may not be back in church again. God, you're, you're not doing anything for me. I'm still struggling with this virus situation. I'm struggling that members of my family are sick. I'm struggling I can't see members of my family. I, I, my, my job has been affected. Our finances are tight. And all of a sudden, we see and we experience those things and we walk away from what we've believed. We've stopped believing. Now, Jesus says we're slow to believe who He is and we're slow to believe what He came to do. Now, if you remember from last week, 1 Corinthians 15 said, the most important thing is that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. Paul says that's the most important thing of the gospel, that He died, that He was buried, and that He rose again. Now, one of the things that we want to see is why did Jesus come? Why did He go to that cross? Why was the burial, why was the resurrection so important? And one of the things that we can answer with that is he did that in order to take our sins away. Look at John 1.29. This is John the Baptist, and he is speaking, and he says, Look, here comes the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Now, we talked about this last week. Jesus didn't just cover sins like in the Old Covenant. He takes them away. Now, if you were sitting here with me today and, and, and you had Qdoba or you had George's Pizza and I was able to come and I was to take that from you, then you would no longer have it, right? Right. So Jesus comes not to cover sins. He comes to take them away. Now, takes away in the Greek is the word aero, and aero means to carry off. Listen to this definition to take away from another what is his. Wow. To take away from another what is his. So what did Jesus came to do? He came to take away our sins. They, they were ours. And he came to take them away from us. To carry them off. Not just to cover them. To take them away. And if I take something away from you, you don't have it anymore. And so we see in Ephesians chapter 2, Jesus did this to reconcile you back to God through the cross. Now, reconcile means to return to favor. So we were, we were out of favor with God. Why? Because of our sins. And Jesus and God, God the Father was a part of this too. Don't, don't ever believe that God didn't want anything to do with this and that God is trying to punish you and Jesus is just holding him back. No, Father, no, don't do that. No, it was God's idea. It was God's idea to reconcile you and the plan was to reconcile you through Jesus. So God wanted to restore us to favor. He wanted to be able to bless us, but he had to do something with the sin issue. And what Jesus did with the sin issue is completely take him away. Remember 1 Corinthians 15, 17 in the Ganal Standard Version? If Christ is risen, your faith is valuable, and you are no longer in your sins. You are no longer in your sins. You are forgiven, and you are accepted. So, let's dig into this story a little bit more of what happened after that resurrection and how it affects you and I today, but let's invite the Holy Spirit to help us understand that. 
Father, thank you so much. It is just such a joy to be able to meet, even if we're meeting in this way, Father, electronically. Um, your word uh, will not return void. It will accomplish everything you have uh, sent it to do. And so we thank you for those promises, whether we are in person with one another or miles and miles apart. And we thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit, that through the Holy Spirit pointing us to Jesus, we might be able to see this truth more clearly. And we ask those things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I, one of my favorite shows growing up was the A-Team. I don't know if you guys remember the A-Team. And Colonel Hannibal Smith had a line in there. He was smoking that big cigar. And he said, I love it when a plan comes together. You remember that? Did you know he stole that line from God? <laughs> God loves it when a plan comes together too. And what am I talking about? Let's take you to Ephesians chapter 1. Now, last week we talked about how all the blessings come in Christ. All of the blessings that Jesus did everything for the benefit of the church. And we found that in Ephesians chapter 1. So let's take this apart just a little bit more and let's look at what this says. We're going to look at verses 5 through 9. God's unchanging plan has been to adopt us into His own family by bringing us to Himself through Jesus. So, this is all part of God's plan. God, God, is God forcing anything? Is God orchestrating us like puppets? No, not at all. But God saw what our response was going to be to our freedom. He saw the sin that we would commit, and He loved us so much that His plan was, okay, I'm going to send Jesus to pay the price for those sins so that we could be restored into our relationship of favor and blessing with our Heavenly Father. So his plan was to adopt us, not to leave us on our own, not to leave us into slavery. His plan was to adopt us back into his family through Christ. Now, here's the cool thing about adoption. Now, there's a lot of cool things about being a biological son or daughter. But when you are adopted, you are specifically chosen. You are specifically chosen. A biological child isn't specifically chosen like the nation of Israel. They were chosen because they were the nation of Israel. But the Gentiles, whom we're a part of, we were adopted. We were specifically chosen to enter into this family through Christ Jesus. Remember I told you last week that God doesn't only love you, but He likes you? Well, that's a great illustration of that. So we've been chosen to be adopted in this family. Now listen to this. This gave Him great pleasure. <laughs> It gave God great pleasure to adopt you back into the family through Jesus. Man, that's incredible. If you're ever wondering whether or not God is pleased with you, it tells you right here that when you're a part of the family, it gives Him great pleasure. He is so rich in kindness, He purchased our freedom through the blood of His Son. Our sins are forgiven God's plan has been revealed. Now, watch this. A plan centered on Christ. A plan centered on Christ. It's not about us. It includes us. But the plan was centered on Christ. That's why we talk about Jesus all the time. Because God's plan was centered on Christ. And then it says it was designed to His great pleasure. So twice in those four verses, we see how this plan to adopt us into the family gives God great pleasure. That's a wonderful thing. So this is a part of God's plan, to adopt you and I into the family. So Jesus effectively removed the curse because, again, you were either under the curse or the blessing. And you were under the blessing in the Old Covenant by obeying it all or by offering the right sacrifices. You were under the curse if you did not obey at all or you did not offer the right sacrifices. And so that was a problem because we spent most of our time under the curse. Mankind spent most of their time under the curse. So God wanted to, to, to change that. He wanted to be able to bless us. And we told you in the New Covenant, there's only blessings. There is no curse in the New Covenant. 
you can miss out on the blessings, but there are no curses. Now watch what happens in Galatians chapter 3. All who depend on the law to make them right with God are under a curse. Now this is really significant. It's as significant to me as Isaiah 64. Isaiah 64 says all our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. It doesn't say all our sins. Now, are all our sins a filthy rag and icky and yucky? Yes, absolutely. But it says in that Isaiah 64 that all our righteousnesses, all of the good things we do to try to get right with God are like a filthy rag. So interestingly here, it doesn't say all who break the law are under a curse. It doesn't say that. It says all who depend upon the law to make themselves right with God are under a curse. So if you and I are trying to look at the good things we do, we're trying to look at our behaviors to get us close to God, to make us righteous, then you're under a curse. You're spinning your wheels. You're not going anywhere, and you're going to stay under the curse. Now, does that mean that Christians can be under the curse? Yes, absolutely, because it says all. All who depend on the law. So you and I can be a new covenant Christian still living under the old covenant of law. Where the old covenant of law is trying to get us to do the right things in order to be acceptable to God when the new covenant is completely about what Jesus did to make us acceptable to God. So just like David, David was in the old covenant but David had a new covenant mindset. He, he knew the Messiah was coming and he knew what the Messiah was going to do. And you'll see that throughout the, the Old Testament. You'll see it in, in the later chapters, 30, 31, 32, 33 of Jeremiah, where he talks about it. You see it in Joel, who talks about that Jesus coming and the prophecy. You see it in the books of Isaiah. Um, Isaiah typically in the, the latter half of the books of Isaiah, is talking about the new covenant. It's talking about what happens when Jesus comes. So you see this shadow into substance in the old covenant. We had old covenant prophets and kings who understood the Messiah was coming. Now they weren't in the new covenant, but they understood what was happening. And just like that, today we have new covenant believers who are choosing to walk under the laws and rules and regulations of the Old Covenant. And nothing works. And guess what? The Bible tells us that they're under a curse. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Now why did he do that? Here it is. The purpose was so the blessing of Abraham would come through Christ and the promised spirit through faith. So the reason that Jesus went to that tree, the reason that Jesus took all our sins, the reason that he paid the price for everything is so we would be freed from the curse. And you know what's happening? Even though Jesus did that, there are many of us that are still choosing to walk under the law and walk under the Old Testament and we are cursed. Galatians 5 goes on to tell you, you know what? You, you have been set free. Christ has liberated you into freedom. Don't fall back into slavery again don't fall back into the yoke of slavery the yoke of slavery that he's talking about there is the law so again God's given us freedom God's given us freedom to walk in the new covenant or God's given us freedom even as new covenant believers to go back and walk under the old but if you do uh, please understand that you will still be under the curse nothing works so what does this resurrection tell us today well, it tells us that God wants us to believe. He doesn't want us to be slow to believe like those believers on the road to Emmaus. He wants us to believe in what Jesus says. He wants us to be the first to see Jesus in His glory. Now, remember what glory is. In, in Exodus 33, Moses is talking to God. And, and he wants to see God's glory. And he asks him, God, show me your glory. And God says, okay, I will make all of my goodness pass before you. So when we talk about the glory of the Lord, you can substitute the word goodness there. So when we talk about how we want people to see the glory of Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit is pointing us to the glory of Jesus Christ, 
what we're really saying practically is we want people to see how good God is. We want people to see the goodness of Jesus. And so God wants us to see that glory, wants us to see that goodness so that we can go and tell other people. And we find that so beautifully in the story of Mary. Now we find that in John chapter 20. And so if you're following along, you could go to John chapter 20. But before I take you there, I want to take you to Proverbs chapter 8. Proverbs chapter 8, I love those who love me, and those who search for me will find me. Those who search for me will find me. So Mary, Mary Magdalene, she was so close to Jesus, and, and she was just literally broken when all of this happened. And so she gets up early after Jesus' death on the cross, now, we're guessing maybe 3 or 4 a.m., but she gets up early and she goes back to the tomb. She's taken some spices, and the Bible tells us it was still dark in John chapter 20, verse 1. So Mary is very clearly seeking Jesus. She wants to be one of the first. And so she goes back to the tomb in John chapter 20, and she finds nothing the stone has been rolled away the tomb is empty and so she runs and she grabs Peter she tells the disciples we see this in verses 2 through 10 in chapter 20 of John she tells the disciples and she says hey Peter John specifically they've taken the Lord she doesn't know what's happened at this point again she's not believing what Jesus has already told them so she runs and she gets them and she says, hey, they've taken the Lord. And so Peter and John are running to the tomb. And, and Peter gets there first. And he kind of looks inside, but he won't go inside. And John looks, and the Bible says that John goes in. And then listen to what it says. John saw and believed, and then the disciples went home. <laughs> now, I'm not saying I'd have done anything different. I don't have any idea. I might not have even gone to the tomb. But you just go to the tomb, and the guy's not there, and then you just go home like, like nothing's happened? I mean, that, that's just incredible to me. It shows me um, the personality and the very humanness of these disciples, that they weren't superhuman. They were like you and me, and they responded like you and me. But Mary, again, she's there first. She wants to, to take care of the body of Jesus. She sees that he's gone. She goes and gets these guys. These guys see, and then they leave. Mary doesn't. Mary is seeking him personally because she wants personal answers. She's seeking him personally because she wants personal answers. You and I are facing needs and challenges and wants and struggles like many of us have never faced before. And you need personal answers to that struggle that you've got. But you're going to have to spend personal time with Jesus in order to get those answers. It's, it's kind of like Sunday mornings when, when we normally have church and you know we've got 125, 150 people in church that day, whatever it is, and I'm out in the lobby, and it's, it's almost like a receiving line at the wedding. You know, you're shaking this guy's hand, you're hugging this guy, you're shake, clapping this guy in the back. I don't have time in that moment, in that public setting, to give you personal answers to the difficulties that you're going through. There's, it, it's not the time, it's not the place. We're, we're not having an intimacy there that I can really talk to you about the things that you're struggling with. Now, last night... I spent about an hour on the phone with someone in our church who's going through some struggles related to all the things that are going on. But it was one-on-one. -on -one. And so I can share some personal answers to the struggles that they're having. Does that make sense? I I'm hoping it does because we we've got to spend personal time with Jesus in order to get those personal answers. Does church help? Absolutely. When you're around a lot of people, man, that corporate worship, that corporate teaching, that corporate anointing is powerful. But again, 
it's just not the time for me to spend 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes with you personally to give you the answers that you need. And so that's what Mary is doing here. She's going personally to Jesus. And what we see in the disciples is a lot of what we see sometimes in church today. They, they go to the tomb, they see the good news, and then they just go home. People come to church at times and they, they hear the good news and they, they see all the things that God is doing and then they just go home. And, and they don't do anything with that. They don't share the goodness and the glory of God with anybody. So again, nothing's changed. We see the same types of things that in, in this story that we see today. Now Mary's not left. Mary's still wanting to spend some personal time with Jesus. And so Mary's there, and all of a sudden, she looks inside the tomb and she sees two angels sitting inside the tomb. Folks, this is the first time in Scripture you're going to find two angels sitting. Angels are always active. They're, they're, they're fighting, they're flying, they're delivering a message, they're whatever. They're sitting. Now, what is this a picture of? This is a picture of the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant is the, is the gold box that Israel carried around. It basically was the presence of God. It had the, 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 the remnants of the Ten Commandments that Moses had broken, so the stone tablets. It had a, the pot of manna, and it had Aaron's rod inside that. That Ark of the Covenant was inside the Holy of Holies. And when the priest came once a year, he sprinkled blood on that Ark of the Covenant in order to cover, not, not take away, in order to cover the people's sins. And on top of that Ark, again, it's a, it's a rectangular box, and on each side of that Ark, there's angels that are sitting with their wings out and they're guarding and protecting that ark. Now what we see here is a picture of that. That ark is a shadow of something greater. Now go back to Exodus 25, 22. Exodus 25, 22. And God says, I will meet with you and talk with you above the mercy seat. So God is saying when, when the priest sprinkles the blood on the ark, it covers our sins, and so now God can meet with us and talk with us above the mercy seat. All right? Mary gets to see the substance of that shadow because Mary gets to be the first one to meet and talk with Jesus above the mercy seat. Now, if you think of that tomb, that tomb was stone. Jesus, they would have wrapped his body in the white linen. It would have been incredibly bloody. Incredibly bloody, those grave clothes. And that blood would have gotten on the stones of the tomb where he laid. So unlike the shadow of the old covenant where the priest sprinkled blood on the mercy seat to cover for the sins, that blood of Jesus Christ shed on those stones was going to remove sins forever. So because that blood was shed here, and it's a picture of the ark, Mary is the first to speak to God above that mercy seat. Listen to Hebrews 10. It's not possible for the blood of bulls to take away our sins. God says, I don't want animal sacrifices. God's will for us was to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus once for all time. Once for all time. You have been made holy because of what Jesus did, not because of any of your actions. Folks, let me be real blunt. It is blasphemous to think that any of our actions can make us holy. And there are churches who teach that, that your actions and your behavior leads to holiness. There is absolutely no possible way that your or my actions and behavior can lead to holiness. It's just not possible. We're made holy through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. 
and then out of that, behavior follows. So remember Mary. Her doctrine is bad, okay? She doesn't believe. She doesn't believe, but her heart is seeking Him. Now, if God had to make a choice, God would rather say, I'd, I want your heart before I want your head. I want your heart first. And what we find in, in my testimony and the testimony of so many people in this church, as they hear the good news of the gospel of grace, their head goes, no, I don't believe that. My experience, my tradition, and my preference fights against that. That, that can't possibly be true. It's too good to be true. And so I fight against that. And yet, what happens is our heart knows it's true. Our heart knows it's true. I knew it was true. My heart knew it was true before my head knew it was true. And I, I remember telling God in, in late December 2010, God, I don't understand all this, but my heart knows it's true and I will preach it. And I will preach it till the day I die. So Mary's head, her doctrine isn't right yet, but her heart wants to follow Jesus. Look at Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. Guard your heart, out of it come the issues of life. Now, is your mind important? Absolutely, your mind's important. But God says, guard your heart, because out of your heart come the issues of life. Look at what we see in John 5 and 1 Corinthians 13. Jesus is saying to the Pharisees, you search the Scriptures for life, and they point to me, yet you refuse to come to me for life. In 1 Corinthians 13, you can possess all knowledge, but if you don't have love, then you're nothing. So, we've got to be careful. There's a lot of people in our world who have a lot of head knowledge about the Bible. There's a lot of head knowledge. There's a lot of really smart people. The Pharisees had incredible head knowledge, but it didn't transfer into their heart, and so it didn't change them. God would much rather have your heart seeking Him and your brain will follow. And we, we put a lot of rules, we put a lot of regulations, we put a lot of restrictions on people to improve behavior. Do you know what the Bible says about those rules and restrictions in order to try to improve our behavior? Look at Colossians chapter 2. Now it says in there, don't be taken captive by any mindless philosophy any human philosophy. But later it says, don't handle, don't taste, don't touch. Don't handle, don't taste, don't touch. And Paul says these are human teachings. They're human teachings. They seem wise because they require devotion. They require self-denial. They require discipline. But they provide no help in conquering evil desires. Wow. All of those rules, all of those restrictions, all of those laws we try to put on people look good, but they do nothing to help you avoid sin. Nothing. Now, what's the answer? Well, we take Luke 7 and John 14 and we take them together. And we see in Luke 7 that a woman, probably a prostitute, came to Jesus at a bunch of a gathering of a bunch of religious people and she literally washes her hair her feet his feet with her hair and her tears and the pharisees are like wow if they knew what kind of woman this was you know he wouldn't even let her touch him and Jesus then says her sins are many but she knows that she has been forgiven so she loves much. He says, you believe your sins are little, and so as a result, you love little. And then if we pair that with John chapter 14, because remember the Bible's a puzzle, and all those pieces go together. So Jesus is saying, when you know how many sins you have been forgiven of, you will love much. And in John 14, he says, the person who loves much obeys much. So if we're really trying to improve and change behavior, if we're really trying to eliminate those evil desires and actions from our lives, it's not by putting a bunch of new rules and regulations on us. It's by understanding how much we have been forgiven, how many sins we have been forgiven of, 
And when you understand how much you've been forgiven, you will love much. And when you love much, you will obey much. Amen? So, continuing in John chapter 20, Mary's crying. And, and the angels, why are you crying? This is, this is the time for great joy. The, the tomb is empty. They don't understand why she's in tears. The same question could be asked of us today. Why are you sad? Why are you depressed? Why are you crying? Jesus has risen from the dead. He's paid the price for our sins. We have been set free. The, the obstacles have been removed. The, the, the stone wasn't rolled away for Jesus to get out. It was rolled away for us to get in. And so we see the angels ask her this question. And they say, now watch, this is significant. Woman, why are you crying? Now later on, down in verse 14, she sees Jesus. She didn't know it was him. Just like the disciples on the road to Emmaus. They don't recognize him. She thought he was the gardener. Now this is actually appropriate. Because he obviously was in the garden with Adam and Eve. And so you could see him and consider him as a gardener. So she thinks he's the gardener. And, and Jesus then says to her, Woman, why are you crying? Just like the angels. Woman, why are you crying? And she says to him, just please tell me where you've taken him. I, I, just, I just, again, she thinks he's the gardener. I just want to be with my Lord. I just want to be with Jesus. And you remember some of the verses from earlier? That those who get up early and seek him, they will find him. You remember that Mary was at the tomb early. She was looking for Jesus. You remember that when John and Peter left and they went home, Mary stayed. Because she wants to be with Jesus. So she tells Jesus, who she doesn't recognize, please just tell me where you've taken him. I, I just want to be with him. Now watch what he, he does here, because things change. At first he says, woman, why are you crying? Now what he says is this, Mary. Mary. Everything changes with that one word. Folks, when you can begin to understand that Jesus knows your name, everything will change. It will change your sorrow to joy. It will change your darkness to light. He knows your name. And so for Mary, the tears are changed to incredible joy when she hears her name. You remember Exodus 33? We talked about how Moses said, show me your glory, and God said, I'll let all my goodness pass by you listen to this very next verse you have found grace in my sight I know you by name wow so Moses asks to see God's glory God says I'll let all my goodness pass before you why because you have found grace in my sight and I know you by name wow <laughs> that is incredible in John chapter 10, it says he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. He protects them from the thief. He protects them from the wolf. He protects them from the devourer. Why? Because he knows you by name. In Acts 22, we read the story of Saul who would become Paul. And it says, Saul, Jesus says, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now, no one else hears the voice. No one else hears the voice but Saul, Paul, because Jesus called him by name. So today, no matter what you're going through, I want you to understand, Jesus knows your name. Blood has been shed, your sins have been forgiven, and when you know your family, it leads you from weeping to worship. It leads you from unbelief to belief. It leads you from fear to faith. And so after Jesus talks to Mary and they establish this, Jesus says later, go to my brothers. Tell them I go to my God and your God, my Father and your Father. Now that was the first time that he called his disciples brothers. And notice what he says. I go to my God and your God. My Father and your Father. 
The resurrection of Jesus Christ has opened this door to allow us to be adopted into the family. And when you know that, if, if I have adopted you, guess what? I know your name. If I've adopted you into my family, I know your name. And guess what? Now that you have been adopted, you are entitled to all of the blessings of my family. So she goes back. She tells him he's risen. Now she's already told him that. And they jump for joy and go out and shout it in the streets, right? Wrong. <laughs> Mark chapter 16. When they heard he was alive, they did not believe. <laughs> they did not believe. Now, John goes on to tell us later, the doors were locked because of fear, so they still didn't believe. Even though Mary has told them twice, even though Peter and John have seen an empty tomb, they still don't believe. They don't believe until Jesus comes and stands right in front of them and he says, peace. And he shows them his hands and he shows them his side. Now, in John, you see side. In Luke, you see feet. In John, you see side because the Gospel of John is about love. And that's where that heart of love is, is in the side. And so John emphasizes the side here because it's a heart of love. And that word peace in the Greek is irene. It means security, safety, prosperity, and fearing nothing from God. So Jesus has risen from the dead. Again, disciples, their, heart, their, 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 their heads aren't in the right place. They don't believe. Jesus has to stand in front of them and he shows them the proof of the resurrection and that proof of the resurrection brings peace they're in major sin they're in doubt they're in unbelief but there's no guilt shame or condemnation that jesus brings to them he only brings to them peace and that proof that he brings through the power of the resurrection is for our hearts listen close it's for our hearts because it's our hearts that condemn us it's our hearts that condemn us. We're fearful for that thing that we did. We're fearful for that thing we didn't do. We're fearful for that thing that we said. We're fearful for that thing we didn't say. We're fearful for that thought we had. We're fearful the, for the thought we didn't have. And the devil jumps on that and he says, Remember that one time. And if we go back and focus on that, then our heart condemns us and we enter into guilt and shame and condemnation. And the only way that you're going to avoid that guilt, shame, and condemnation, the only way for your heart not to condemn you is to absolutely know that your sins have been completely forgiven. Isaiah 44, I swept away your sins, I paid the price to set you free. I swept away your sins, I paid the price to set you free. If you'll look at that devotional that Spurgeon has in there, he says, Unlike clouds, our sins yield to us no gentle showers, but rather threaten to deluge us with a flood of destruction. God himself reveals his grace. He at once and forever effectually removes the mischief by blotting it out from existence once for all. Against the justified man, no sin remains. The sin of all the chosen was forever put away and completely and effectually pardoned. Why should pardoned sinners live at a distance from God? You don't have to live at a distance from God anymore. But if you don't know that Jesus has effectively paid the price for your sins, your heart will condemn you. Guilt, shame, and condemnation come and you'll walk at a distance from God. And you know, I, I know there are many people that are saying, God is holy. He can't ignore sin. I completely agree. I completely agree. Because God is holy, He can't ignore sin. But I will also state this to you. Because God is holy, He will never punish sin twice. And He has already punished sin completely in the body of His Son, Jesus. On the cross, in John 19.30, when Jesus said, it is finished, that word finished is the word teleo in Greek. It means to bring to a close, to end, to perform the last act which completes a process. Amen? What was the process? It was God's unchanging plan 
to adopt us into the family through Jesus. And his act on that cross completed the process. Sin is completely gone. It has been wiped away forever. Now, do we still sin? Absolutely. Absolutely. We still sin. But I'm not a sinner anymore. The Bible calls me a saint. I'm the most holy one. I'm not a sinner saved by grace anymore. I am a saint who occasionally sins. And when I sin, I do not need to apply the blood of Jesus again. That's been applied once and for all. But when I do sin, I need to go to Ephesians chapter 5, and I need to be washed daily by the water of the Word. Remember that I get that dust off because dust is the devil's food? And so today, I still sin, yes, but I don't need to reapply the blood. I apply the water of the Word, which generally cleanses me. Now, there are some people who are afraid of death. We've talked about that. And they are afraid of Jesus coming back again. Why are they afraid of death? Why are they afraid of Jesus coming back? Because they're concerned about their sin. They don't know if they've done enough. So let me take you, as we close this today, to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28. Hebrews 9, 28. I'm going to read it to you in two separate versions, the New Living Translation and the Amplified, okay? This will help you get over some of the fear of death or the fear of Christ coming back. Christ died only once as a sacrifice to take away sins. He will come again, but not to deal with our sins again. Why? He's already dealt with them. He will come again, but not to deal with our sins again, but to bring salvation to all who are eagerly awaiting Him. Now, what kind of salvation? The salvation of your body. The salvation of your body. Your spirit saved. Your soul is in process of being saved. And your body will be saved completely when Jesus comes back. Okay? So let me read that to you in the Amplified Version. Christ having been offered once to take upon himself and bear as a burden the sins of many, once for all, will appear a second time, not to carry any burden of sin, nor to deal with sin, but to bring full salvation to the body to those who are waiting for him. Amen? So what's the purpose of all this? Don't glorify sin. Don't glorify your problems and your difficulties. Glorify Jesus. Look to Him and see all of His goodness. Focus on Him from start to finish. He loves you. He likes you. He knows your name and He has set you free. Amen? Father, thank You so much for this reminder of what the cross and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus has done. It has completely and effectively removed our sins so we don't have to be stuck in guilt, shame, and condemnation. So our hearts don't condemn us. Father, thank you that you know our names and thank you for the blessings that come with knowing our name. It's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Thanks again for joining us. We are praying for a quick end to this situation so that we'll be able to meet again in person very soon. Take care and have a great week.